Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Glenn. It's, it's nice to see everyone here. It's, um, it's nice to experience winter. We don't really have it as much in Toronto. We had some snow, but you know, I wanted that cold, crisp sort of thing. So, But I'm leaving tonight because I've had enough and it's, <laughs> it's okay. It's time to go. Uh, I want to thank uh, Glenn uh, and the uh, law school for the invitation. I, 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 do, I really like Saskatoon. I've been here a number of times and I like coming back. I'm very pleased that Yvonne is here. I'm very honored that she's here and will be uh, sharing some comments. And you're very fortunate that she's here and can do that. Um, so as Glenn mentioned, I work for an organization called Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto. Uh, we're in the process of changing our name because we don't just have programs in Toronto. We have programs throughout uh, southern Ontario and the near north in Ontario. So the Toronto thing is a bit of a misnomer. And plus, I find it doesn't help. Like when you're traveling around the country and you say, hi, I'm from Toronto, that usually doesn't get you a lot of good things said about you. And I hate the Leafs, so you can say whatever you want about the Leafs, that's not a problem. But, um, but, we, but Toronto doesn't really describe what we, where we work. But the more important name we have is not our English name. Uh, it's our Ojibwe name which was given to us uh, in a ceremony by Elder Jackie Lavallee. Uh, how many people here uh, speak Ojibwe? OK. <laughs> See, I feel much more comfortable speaking uh, when no one speaks Ojibwe. Um, but uh, the name we were given was Gakina Gwaiwabama de Bwewen, which uh, translates as all those who seek the truth. And that's not so much, for, for me, that's not so much a description of what we do, but a direction to us. That what we have to do is help find ways for people to find the truth. And I'm going to talk about that today in the context of Gladue and Gladue Report. I want to start with a story. This story is a true story. I was there. So it's pretty much true. I mean, it was a long time ago, so my memory may not be quite perfect. It starts. It's on October 12th. I know exactly the date. It's October 12th, 1998. And I am driving from Toronto to Ottawa. I'm driving in a gray Mazda 3, Mazda Protégé. Not as sporty as they are now. It's a, it was an older one. And in the car with me is Professor Kent Roach. And the reason that we're going to Ottawa is that Aboriginal Legal Services is intervening at the Supreme Court of Canada in the Corbier case. Corbier in Canada, the case about officer voting rights. And Kent, uh, who's a great friend of uh, ALS, and who was, I think at the time, uh, or was around the time he was dean here, a very brief period of time, um, he was representing us. So that we, our legal team was Kent and uh, Kim Murray, who is now the executive director of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, who will on April 1st be uh, the first assistant deputy attorney general in Ontario in charge of Aboriginal issues. So she and Kent uh, were uh, gowned and arguing the case, and I was there uh, as part of the legal team and to um, lead the cheering at the Supreme Court. Because someone has to be at the back doing the cheerleading at the Supreme Court, doing the wave and things like that. So. If you've never been to the Supreme Court, don't do the wave. They, 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 it, as it turns out, they're not fond of that. So we're driving to Ottawa for the Corbier case. I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure that Bruce Springsteen is playing because Kent and I really like Bruce Springsteen, so we would have been playing Bruce Springsteen. And as we're driving, Kent says, you know, there's a case going to be heard at the Supreme Court of Canada in December called Gladue. And it's about Section 7182E and Aboriginal people. Do you think Aboriginal Legal Services wants to intervene? And I thought, yeah, probably. That sounds like a good idea. And so we go to Ottawa. Uh, Kent and Kim argue Corbier. We drive back, to, we go back to Toronto. And we think, well, let's see if we can get into this case, this Gladue case, which is going to be argued essentially two months 
uh, we have two months from when we get back to Toronto. So Kim and I do what we normally do when we were, when we were contemplating doing a, a court of appeal, app, or a Supreme Court case. We went to our favorite uh, Sichuan Chinese restaurant for lunch, and we would order whatever the special was. And we would talk about what it is we wanted to say, what it is we thought we might contribute to this particular case. And we didn't have much time, so we talked about it. I wrote something up, Kent did a factum. And on December 10th, uh, 1998, we found ourselves at the Supreme Court of Canada intervening in the Gladue case. Let me just say here for the moment, and, and to be correct, um, there's a pronunciation issue. When you're in Ontario and East, we say Gladue. But when you're in Manitoba West, you really should say Gladue. So I understand that there's a pronunciation issue, and I try and be respectful. And when I'm west of Ontario, I try and say Gladue. So I will try and do that, but I may, I may screw up. So please forgive me. So we're in Ottawa, and we're going to argue this case. And we were the only organization intervening at the Supreme Court on behalf of uh, Jamie Gladue. When we were in Corbiere, which was Officers of Voting Rights, there were all sorts of Aboriginal organizations there. But in criminal justice, when you do criminal justice stuff, there generally is nobody. Um, for whatever reason, and, and I understand this, many Aboriginal organizations uh, don't find criminal law to be the place that they want to put their energy. So you get, whenever we have these sort of cases, the, uh, largely the political uh, organizations are not present. So we were the only organization there. And we, and Kent uh, did a great job arguing uh, the Gladue decision. And um, so it was, a, it was an interesting day. And then a few months later, April 23rd, 1999, the Supreme Court of Canada releases its decision in Gladue. Now, back in 19, back in 1999, whoa, those old, Back in 1999, people didn't have this, this whole internet thing and this email thing. You, they faxed you. What happened is the Supreme Court would fax you the decision a few minutes before they released it publicly. So uh, I'm in the office on April 23rd, 1999, waiting for the decision to come in because they tell you in advance that it's going to come out. And I'm very excited because it's going to come out. And it arrives. And it's an incredible decision. You know, I have to say, getting that decision was really remarkable. That is, I, it's, it's a remarkable decision. Um, I don't know how often, if you've ever read the decision, how often you've read it. I try and read it every month or so, but I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, but it's a really significant decision. It's really significant. The Supreme Court of Canada said in that decision that the criminal justice system has failed the Aboriginal peoples of Canada that the, the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people was a crisis in the Canadian criminal justice system. Very important words. The Supreme Court of Canada didn't say, the problem is Aboriginal people commit crime. The Supreme Court said, the problem is the way we, the way the court system deals with Aboriginal people who commit crime. We don't do it right. And we have created this crisis of overrepresentation. And they talked about uh, some of the factors that lead to overrepresentation. They talk about the fact that racism towards Aboriginal people in jails is rampant. Their word, at racism towards Aboriginal people in jails is rampant. A fact that the Office of the Correctional Investigator has continued to show sadly exists today. It was an incredibly significant decision. And, you know, I have to say, as a lawyer, that was a pretty cool moment. Right? I mean, this is why I got into the business. You know, I wanted to do something and, you know, the sort of abstract dreams that you have when you're in law school, whatever they, I want to make the world a better place or all these sort of, anyway, I actually was involved in something and it did it and it was really, really cool. And on top of it, which made it even more interesting, um, not that that's, this is the main thing, but I'll be on, you know, why would I lie to you? Um, the decision comes out and Kent, 
is at some meeting in northern Saskatchewan, and he can't even be reached. And Kim has just had her first child, so she can't be reached. I always know how old Kim's child is, because while I never remember her birthday, I know that Claudio came out <laughs> in April 1999. So I don't tell Renee that I, that's how I know how old she is, but that's how old I know how old she is. And we get their phone calls. I do a bunch of phone interviews. The Globe and Mail, the front page of the Globe and Mail on Saturday has this article about how the criminal justice system has failed Aboriginal people. The Indigenous Bar Association is meeting in Toronto that weekend. In Toronto that weekend. And we, Kim and I, go to the meeting. Kim's got Renee. And we go to the meetings and we walk around. And of course, we're like, we're pretty cool. Because we were involved, you know, hey, yeah, it's OK. <laughs> no, really, it's all right. <laughs> so it's, it, was, it was pretty neat. And then Monday comes, and I, we're waiting for the world to change. And very little happens. Very little happens. It's a remarkable thing. You know, you think the Supreme Court says something. You think that's going to change everything. But that's not how it works. That's not, sometimes that's how it works. But not all the time. And that's not how it works generally when you're working with people who are marginalized, people who don't have access to the systems, to the systems of power. The criminal justice system is a system. It has a whole bunch of moving parts. It's a very slow moving, cumbersome system. That, for some people, is its virtue. But it's slow and it doesn't change easily. And sometimes we think, and this is fed partly by our law school experience, fed by watching movies where Al Pacino plays a crusading lawyer or whatever. We think that getting a decision from the court ends the process. Decision comes out, everything's great, credits roll, the world changes. But that's not how it goes. Decision from the court, like Gladue, is important. But it's just a step. It just starts you on the next step the other work you have to do to make change happen. Because courts, if you're involved in this sort of work, courts are important to make the change, but they're not going to do it on their own. And one of the things that we know at Aboriginal Legal Services, we're a, a large, or we're not that large, but we offer a lot of programs. So one of the programs we have is the Aboriginal Court Worker Program. So we were able to see right from the beginning, whether glad you made a difference. Within the first week of the decision coming out, I had written a sort of seven-page summary, put it up on our website so lawyers could use it. And again, we're waiting to see things happen. And nothing's happening. Nothing is happening. It was very weird. But we knew nothing was happening. We would get phone calls from people. We get phone calls from clients who were in jail. They call us collect from. Uh, somewhere in, in Ontario, and they'd say, I heard about this case. My lawyer doesn't know what I'm talking about. What should I do? And we'd say, well, you know, when you're in the prisoner's box and you're being sentenced, say gladu and hope someone in the room knows what you're talking about. Really. And we had cases where the only reason it worked was because the Crown had read the decision, and the Crown explained to everyone what Gladue was. It, was. it was surprising how little had changed. And so... A year later, in September 2000, we were, at a, we were invited to a conference of provincial court judges in Ottawa. And we were invited to talk, I think the session was called, The Realities of the Urban Aboriginal Offender, or some title that you have like that for a conference. And we talked about the fact that nothing was happening with Gladue. And that had a huge resonance because one of the themes of the conference, because we were talking to some of the judges, is that judges across the country were going, I have this decision which tells me I'm supposed to do something. And I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I don't know how I'm supposed to do it. Because the Supreme Court said we were supposed to do anything, but no one said how it is we do these things. 
And so there was this frustration. And um, so we gave, we were at this session and we gave this little talk. And at the end of the talk, uh, Justice Patrick Shepard, who's a judge at the Old City Hall Courts in Toronto, came to see us after and he said, what about, what do you think if we had a court in Toronto just dealing with Aboriginal people? What do you think? I think it's a great idea. And so we were involved for the next year in helping to set up a, what was called the Gladue, Gladue because we're in Ontario, the Gladue Aboriginal Persons Court. And it opened in uh, November 2001. There are now five such courts in uh, Toronto. There's one in Sarnia, there's one in London, there's one in Brantford. Uh, there's one opening in Thunder Bay. There are, there are First Nations courts in British Columbia. There are a number of these sorts of courts. And so as the court was being developed, we thought the idea was you have this court, you'd have judges who knew something, you have some training, they'd, they'd have an interest in Aboriginal people, you'd hopefully have Crown attorneys who had some training, hopefully defense counsel, duty counsel who knew something. So we thought that's all pretty good. But we thought, how are judges going to get information about the Aboriginal person before the court? Because what Gladue talked about, what the decision talks about, is that in order to make this decision real, in order to make the Gladue decision real, in order to sentence Aboriginal people properly, judges need two types of information. They need to know about the individual before them, their life circumstances, and some of the systemic issues that may have influenced them. They need to know that. And they also need to know what programs might be out there that will help address those issues. That's what courts need to know. And simply setting up another court, it's a great idea, but simply setting up a court isn't necessarily going to be a way for people to get this sort of information. So how are we going to get this information? And so we thought, because, you know, we didn't know. We don't know what we're doing. We're making this up as we go along, which is okay. That's sometimes what you have to do. We thought, okay, what we'll do is, why don't we have someone write reports and tell this per help this person tell their story? And so we came up with the idea of this thing called the Gladue Report. And so we started doing Gladue Reports in uh, November 2001. We didn't copyright the name Gladue Report, which was a big mistake on our part. If we could just get five cents every time someone said Gladue Report, we would be out of all financial difficulty. Life would be good, but we didn't do that. And we started the Gladue Reports. And so I want to talk a little bit about this for a couple reasons. One, because this work that we did was about trying to make this decision real. That it's fine to spend time in court. It's fine to get good precedence. But that's not enough. Social change is not given to you. Courts don't give you social change. If you're interested in social change, you have to work. Law is one way to work at it. Litigation is one way to work at it. But it's not the only way to work at it. It may be what you're good at, which is great. But then you have to find other people who are good at the other things. Because, as I said, no one's going to do it for you. You have to start doing it, and then things might change. So we thought, OK, we're going to do Gladue reports. We didn't think anyone was going to fund Gladue reports, so we got a little bit of money from an organization called Nizwebeek Aboriginal Employment and Training. We got a little uh, grant. We hired a woman named Mandy Wesley, uh, who was our first Gladue writer. Um, and and she started writing our Gladue reports. And there's no one way to do Gladue reports, and people do them different ways, so I can only talk about our experience. And, I, and it's also important for me to say, I should have said this earlier, I'm telling you about our experience. I'm not telling you that this is the way you have to do things. I'm not saying this is what has to happen in Saskatchewan. I don't know what's going on here well enough to be able to do that, and it would be sort of arrogant of me to think that I can tell you what to do. What I can do is share our experience, and you can take from that what you want, and if it's relevant, take what part of it is relevant and use it in, in your work. So we, we did these Gladue reports, and 
And we knew, we knew what we didn't want them to be. We didn't want them to be pre-sentence reports. I don't, I've never seen your pre-sentence reports, so I can't speak to them. I can tell you about pre-sentence reports in Ontario. Pre-sentence reports in Ontario are divided up into a bunch of sections, you know, education, family, various things. And they're all f one section, one minute you're talking about education, then you're talking about family, and then you're talking about this. I can never figure out anyone's life. I have to cut them up, put them back on the, the, on the ground, rearrange the papers, try and put the person's life together because I can't figure it out. The other thing about pre-sentence reports in Ontario is I find I learn a lot about the person who's writing the pre-sentence report, but I find very little about the person who's the subject of the pre-sentence report. The pre-sentence report never has the voice of the person who's being interviewed. And it's always written in a voice that makes you think they're lying. It does. It says, Mr. Smith says his mother's name was Betty and his father's name was Bill. Really? Didn't he know that? I mean, everything is written in this kind of suspicious voice. And, and so you just come away feeling, Ugh. What kind of guy is this? We didn't want to do that. We wanted, we wanted to find another way to do it. So I'm going to tell you now that what we did was use Aboriginal traditions and Aboriginal traditional ways to come up with the reports. Because that's what we did, but we didn't know we were doing it. Maybe because that's just made sense for people to do. So I'm going to tell you how we're doing something and make it sound like we knew all along how sensible it was, but we didn't really know. But so there are two things about our reports I think are significant. First, they tell a story. Because that's what it is. Your life is your story. And so we tell a story. And that story isn't divided up into, we're going to talk about education here and family here and relationships here. Your life is that whole stream of all those things. So we're going to tell a story. And that story, your story, all of your stories, don't start with you. As important as all of you are, your stories don't start with you. Your stories start with your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and beyond. Your stories are stories that have nothing to do, in some ways, with your parents and your grandparents. Your grandparents. They're about what other people did to your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, wherever you are, whether you're an Aboriginal person, whether you're from another country, initially your family. So much of our lives are things that were outside of our control and our parents' control and our grandparents' control. They were done by other people. And that's part of your story. So our stories start as far back, realistically, as we can go, and as far back as we can go where someone can tell us that story. And that's the other part of the story. To tell someone's story, you want them to tell it. You need to let people tell their own stories. You shouldn't be telling people stories for them. So when we do our reports, we spend a lot of time quoting people. And we quote people directly. We quote our clients. We talk to their, their mothers. We talk to their, their father, their kid, to their children, to their siblings. And we tell their story and everyone's story. Now, that story is not always consistent. right? I have, I have two brothers. Uh, I'm the oldest brother. I was, as an oldest brother, I think this is fair to say, perfect. I think it's fair to say that anyone would have been incredibly lucky to have me as an older brother. However, when you ask my younger brothers about me, they come up with stories that I have no recollection of whatsoever, which means, of course, they must be lying. But their, their understanding and their experience and my experience are different. It doesn't mean we're lying. It doesn't mean one person's right and one person's wrong. That's the reality of telling a story, and that's the reality of someone's life, is that everyone reflects on what they know, and they can speak about what they know, but sometimes people say different things, and that's not a problem. So in our reports, 
We don't try and square the circle or circle the square or do whatever you're supposed to do. We just let people tell their stories. And from those stories, we hope that a truth emerges that people can, that decision makers can rely on. The other thing, though, about telling a story, particularly telling a story for, about to court, let's say I tell you, let's say I say, my childhood was okay. What was your childhood like, Jonathan? It was okay. All of you, that word means nothing, right? The only way that word okay means something is if you all go to your place where you experience childhood and you have, this is my picture of what an okay childhood is. But it has no... It doesn't translate in any other detail. And the other thing is, if you ask people about their life, people can really only reflect on what they know. There are very few people, when we do a Gladue report, very few people, we say, so why do you think you're here? And they say, you know, I think I'm here because of the government colonial plan. It was designed to, in, to destroy indigenous people as indigenous people, which were done a number of different ways, including the treaties and, of course, residential school and the 60 scoop. I mean, most people don't know that. They just know the world around them. They don't know why things are happening. They just know the world around them. And you ask someone, what was your childhood like? And they go, okay. And it was okay because they were all, if everyone around you is being hit, if everyone around you grows up in violence and you grow up in violence, then your life is no different than anyone else's, and it's okay. So part of what we needed to do, and we need to do in the Gladue reports, is to try and get as much information as we can about people's lives so we can clarify it. So if someone says, what was your life like? It's okay, we'll ask more information. So, you know, what was it like growing up, etc. We'll talk to uh, family members, and there's often someone in the family, often, who may, have been, uh, who may have gone through a healing program and who might provide a slightly different perspective. And we put all of that in the report to try and get the person's life a context. Because the reality is the lives of most of our clients, the lives of most indigenous offenders are so far removed, so far removed from the lives of most judges, defense counsel, and crown attorneys that they have no idea. They have no idea that people have lived lives like this. We've often written reports and judges will say, I have never heard a sadder story. And I think, wow, I got a bunch more at the office to make this one look real easy. And that's not to disparage what this person had, but if you didn't know people lived that life, how can you, how are you able to sentence this person without knowing them? This is the thing about the criminal justice system. Criminal justice system works like this. Uh, an appellate court judge recently told me that she found the sentencing process to be like a sausage factory. You know, it goes like this. And in the criminal justice system, if we don't know information, we don't wait for it, we just work on assumptions. You come up to court, you're being sentenced, the Crown attorney, will, the judge will say to the Crown, what's your position? The Crown will give a whole position and explanation based on two pieces of paper. One piece of paper is the, the person's CPIC, their prior criminal record. The other piece of paper is the synopsis of the offense. They, don't know, they might not know the person at all, but they will construct a whole story for this person based on two pieces of paper. And that's who you are. That's who you are. Most judges sentence people, they have no idea who the people are. And you, go, you rely on whatever little limited information you have. And so one of the things that we need to do with these Gladue reports, and one of the reasons it's important to have people talk, is because the people who are being sentenced actually become people. They're not just things on a piece of paper. They're not just a collection of offense dates. They're not just a collection of, oh, they did eight months, then they did 12 months, so this time they have to do 15 months. If people become people, then everyone stops and slows down and thinks about what we need to do. The other thing that we do in the Gladue reports that's important, I think, is that there are certain things, experiences that Aboriginal people have gone through that we can't assume anyone else knows. We always talk at, at, at Aboriginal Legal Services, whenever we go out to court or whatever, we go, okay, we know this, 
and we're going to court, we have to scale it back. So we know this, we have to scale it back sort of to here. And we never scale it back far enough, we really have to go right back to here. Because why would any judge, crown or defense lawyer, know anything about indigenous people in Canada? I know that's a sad thing to say, but why would they? You don't have to learn anything about indigenous people, certainly in Ontario, when you go to school. You don't learn anything necessarily in university. You don't learn anything in law school. Why would you know anything? So what you have, what, what everyone in the legal system has, many of the people in the legal system have, same level of unawareness as anybody else, same level of stereotypes. Um, we got a letter once. I don't usually get letters from judges. We got a letter from a judge once. We wrote a Gladu report for some couple guys who uh, stole some cars outside of Toronto. And um, these two young men uh, were from the Six Nations, first uh, from Six Nations, and their parents or grandparents had been to residential school. So they were uh, suffering from the intergenerational impacts of residential school. And so we wrote in our reports, not only did we talk about, did not only did we say that their parents or grandparents went to residential school, but we talked about intergenerational trauma. And we relied on information from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and various other sources to explain what intergenerational trauma was. So we get this letter from a judge. Again, it's very odd, but nice. The judge thanked us very much for the report. And at one point, the judge says, I'm an Anglican. Well, thank you for sharing. That's, that's, that's great. Um, but the reason he said that was he said, I'm an Anglican, and I learned about residential schools at my church. That's where he learned about residential school. Because the Anglican Church, among the churches involved in residential schools, the Anglican Church has done a lot in the ways of apologies and things. So and they, he went to church and they talked about it. He said, I learned about residential school and church, but no one ever told me about intergenerational trauma. I didn't know about this, so thank you for telling me. This person's a judge. He sentences Aboriginal people. He didn't know anything about it, and why would he? Why would he? We recently had a case, uh, a charter challenge case. Anyway, I won't go into the details. It's a sad, we lost, so I don't want to think about it too much. But anyway, we had three days of expert evidence. We're three days of expert evidence dealing with Aboriginal people. And on the third day, the judge said, to her credit, after hearing all these people talk about the history of Aboriginal people, she said, What's colonialism? Yeah, I know, you're going, what? How can I? You know, and I think, you know, it's good that she asked the question, because I also made the same mistake and thought, but it was a mistake. Why should I assume that she knew? Why would she know? I don't know her background. I don't know anything about her. Why would I think she knew? The so this is the trouble. So much of the experience that indigenous people have is totally foreign to people in the justice system. They don't understand about, they've never heard about the 60s scoop or the millennial scoop. There's a whole series of stereotypes and assumptions about Aboriginal people. And some of those stereotypes and assumptions, it's, you know, some of them come from, uh, from people who don't know. So one of the things about when the Gladue Court started in Toronto, the judges said, well, we'll have a Gladue Court because you know, we really don't know much about Aboriginal people and so we need to learn more. But the other challenge that we face is that uh, uh, let me see how I'm going to phrase this. So I get to travel a lot in my job. It's, it's one of the nice things. I get to come to Saskatoon in February. I can't tell you how jealous everyone was. Um, and I've been to, I have been to every province and territory in Canada through work. <coughs> I haven't managed to make it to Newfoundland and Labrador yet, but every other place. And I travel a lot in, in Ontario. And I've discovered when I travel in Ontario that the further north I go, the stupider I get. Now, I was not aware of this. I didn't know this. Fortunately, people tell me. So I find as I go further and further north, I get stupider and stupider. 
And one of the things that I hear, so I get, so when I go to, I don't know how much, you know, uh, Ontario, when I get to Sudbury, I'm kind of stupid, but when I get to Thunder Bay, it's amazing I can get off the plane if I'm chewing gum, because it's, I'm clearly too stupid to do that. And how do I know that? Because when I go to uh, talk to judges and lawyers, they often tell me, not everyone, I mean, I want to be clear about this, not everyone, and I'm not attributing negative things to people, but a lot of judges and lawyers I talk to say, we don't need Gladue here because we sentence Aboriginal people every day. So we don't need Gladue. And we don't need Gladue because I know, I know these people, right? I, I represented his father. I represented his uncle. I sentenced his mother. I sentenced his sister. And so they say they don't need Gladue. And I'm coming up talking about Gladue and Gladue reports. I say, you're just stupid. We don't need this stuff. There's no need for it. And, and I can't quarrel with, like, I can't say, no, you're wrong, because how do I know? Maybe they're completely right. But what I do when I travel is I often try and go to speak to Aboriginal justice workers, to chiefs, First Nations. And so when I do that, I say to them, so the people who are administering justice to you, whether it be in a fly-in community or a remote community or an urban community, people who do that say they know your community. They've been doing this for a long time and they know your community. Do you think the people who come to your community know your community? And in almost every case, they say, no. They don't know us at all. So this is a really serious disconnect. This is a very serious disconnect. Because you have the people, everyone in the justice system, judges, crowns, defense counsel, thinking they know what they're doing and they know the community they're dealing with. And you have the people in those communities saying they don't know. Now, I can't tell you who's right. I can't tell you who's wrong. But that's a serious disconnect. And what makes it even more serious, of course, is that one of those sets of people has a lot of power, and one of those sets of people doesn't have much power at all. And that's really dangerous, I think. Not knowing something is bad, but you can learn it. But not knowing that you don't know something is even worse. Thinking you know things when you don't, that's even worse. And one of the things that we find with our Gladue reports, and we try and do this, in, we do it in a nice way, is that when we do Gladue reports, we find people who think, who often thought they knew communities, discovering things they didn't know. Because how would they know? And so that's one of the other virtues of Gladue reports. Because one of the realities, I, mean, I don't have to tell you this, you know, Saskatchewan is not, what do I say, the, the world leader in, in Glad You. Uh, <laughs> jailing Aboriginal people does not make you an expert in administering Gladue. That's not to say that Aboriginal, that, that Aboriginal people shouldn't be put in jail. Some Aboriginal people shouldn't be put in jail, obviously. But I think sometimes in places like Saskatchewan, where it seems so, there's, it seems such a daunting task. How are we going to do something that it sometimes paralyzes people? It is interesting that the advances in Gladue in that sort of thing have happened in places where the Aboriginal population is significant. There are more Aboriginal people in Ontario than any other province in, in Canada. There are more Aboriginal people in Ontario than anywhere. But as a percentage of the population, they're not as large. Aboriginal people are as overrepresented in the criminal justice system in Ontario as they are in Manitoba. But Aboriginal people are only 2% of the Ontario population, so only 10% of the jail population. So depending where you are, it doesn't seem as visible of a problem. But Ontario is doing more in the way of glad you, certainly than uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and until recently, Alberta. And it's not a contest, but it is. It, it, it's, it, this is something that has to be dealt with. And I guess part of the message that, that I would say that our experience is, is that you don't have to wait for
for people to give you permission to do things. I mean, our experience at, at Aboriginal Legal Services is that we push as much as we can. We push through litigation, so we go to court. We were, uh, we were involved in IPLE. Uh, we go to court whenever we can, whenever it's helpful. But we also try and put programs in place on the ground. And we work with people. I mean, it, you know, you have to be thoughtful about this. You have to think about what you're doing. But if you want social change to happen, if you want justice to happen, it's not something that gets given to you. And judges, we often find that judges are really receptive. They really like getting good new reports. They can't really order them if they don't exist. But they find they, 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 it, they, they like them. They're helpful. I mean, one of the things that we found overall is that, that most people involved in the court system want to, at the end of the day, feel like they're making a difference. They want to feel like they're making a difference. And most people, uh, not everyone, but most people who get out of a sentencing court where they've done a sentencing every 10 or 15 minutes on, on a sausage factory approach, that was, that was, that was a dynamic light show. Uh, after Yvonne finishes, because I didn't want to do it before, we're going to have a whole like strobe light thing and fireworks are happening. <laughs> we, we, we watched Katy Perry at the Super Bowl and we thought, we, I can do that. The ceiling's too low though for me to come in on a big metal horse thing or anyway. Um, but if you talk to many people who are involved in the justice system, at the end of the day, when they've got this sausage factory happening and they've sentenced people one after another after another without really knowing anything about them, they don't go home feeling like they've done justice. They don't go home feeling that they've done a lot. They've done what they can. But they don't, they're not, it's not a great feeling. And so one of the things that we find is when people have Gladue reports, it doesn't mean everyone agrees at the end. But what it means is people are working with a lot more information and they're and the people that they're sentencing are people. Their voices are heard. They not, may not be speaking directly to the judge, but they speak in the Gladue report, and their voices are heard, and they become a person. And their mother becomes a person, and their father becomes a person, and everybody are people. And that makes it both more challenging to do the work and better and, and, and more worthwhile to do the work. We need, and we don't need to, but it, it's good if we can work, if this work is done together. Um, again, not everyone has to agree, but our experience is that when we do Gladue reports, everyone treats them seriously. Everyone treats them seriously. Uh, we don't always agree at the end. The Crown doesn't, so often the Crown changes their position. Not necessary to where the defense counsel wants them to change their position, but they change their position. Defense counsel suddenly knows more about their client. The judge knows more. And that can't be a bad thing. And bef I just want to say one or two things, and then I'm going to turn it over to Yvonne. And I, I do want to say um, um, Yvonne's book, Stolen Life, is like a Gladue report on steroids. I mean, it's. <laughs> We can't, do, we can't write 300 pages, uh, but, but, if, but if you want a fascinating, just leaving everything else, like what is just an incredibly fascinating read, uh, and, and copies of the book are available, uh, and Yvonne's happy to autograph them. Um, it's, just, it's just a fascinating read. But the, in that book, you have essentially what a Gladue report is about, because you have someone's life, you have the context of that life, you have historical background, you have, you have those things. So I just want to say one thing about uh, Gladue and Gladue reports that I think are important to mention before I, I turn it to uh, Yvonne. And um, this came up in a discussion I was having with Brad Belmore earlier today. I think Gladue reports have a huge, uh, I think they're very positive. But I think that we do need to recognize one potential problem with Gladue reports. I, I hope that we don't follow this in Aboriginal Legal Services. But there is a danger that what we're doing in Gladue reports is pathologizing Aboriginal people. 
and just doing a catalog of all the awful things that happen to Aboriginal people and to equate Aboriginal people with misery and poverty and, and crap. And that's wrong. That's not anyone's, most people's lives are not that. We can't just say, look how awful this person's life is, and then say to the judge, now do something about it. Because the reality is, even those people who've had very difficult lives, many of them have aspects of their lives that, have, that are positive. And it's really important in the context of our work, in the context of our reports, that we talk about what, what's worked for the person as well as what hasn't. So we often meet with the client and we say, look, I notice on your CPIC that you had three years when you had no criminal offenses. What was going on? And they talk about what was going right with their lives. And so it's important that we do that, that we don't fall into the trap. And it's very, very easy, certainly for defense counsel, I think, to fall into the trap of saying, I'm just going to tell you how awful my client's life is and you're going to somehow then, as a judge, feel so sorry for them that you'll give them a lesser sentence or whatever. I mean, Certainly, I feel he talks about the idea of moral blameworthiness and looking at someone's life, but we don't want to make people out to be hopeless and just victims all their lives because people have huge amounts of strength, huge amounts of resilience. It's how they survive. And so part of the report is also about talking about those things. And the other part of the report that's important, if it's going to work, is that it engages the individual in participating in their story. So you don't just tell the story, you engage the person. Okay, let, we're going to talk about this, then we're going to come back another time and we'll think about, you can think about, you know, why were you committing offenses? Or you talk about the fact that you were abused, do you think that might have something to do with your life? And then they think about it, and you try and, you want to engage those, that individual in taking responsibility for their healing too, because at the end of the day, if change is going to happen, no one can make change happen. You can't order someone to change. The individual has to feel that change is, is possible and they have a role in that. And a good Gladu report does that. It makes the person a whole person, not a collection of tragedies. I hope this may have been, uh, that some of this may be helpful and useful for you in your work. Um, and uh, I'm uh, happy now to uh, turn things over to Yvonne for a little while. Thank you, Miigwech. the judge, his name is Judge Olson in Butte, Montana, and uh, my father was with me, and the judge tried to talk to me, and I got up and I tried to talk, and he didn't understand what I was saying because I couldn't speak. Maybe you should give me one of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try to talk louder. It's just hard for me to talk louder because the way I've trained myself to speak 
And then I'm usually just a quiet person. Unless I'm mad, then you know I'm mad. I got that Marine yell. But uh, the story I was talking about was a judge that I went up in front of when I was a young teenager in Butte, Montana. Uh, that was before I had a lot of the reconstructive surgery or the teeth or the ability to even use the upper lip that I didn't have. I went up in front of the judge and I had a lot of self-esteem, self-worth issues, even though internally I saw myself as a very strong, independent individual. And uh, the judge asked me to get up to speak because it had to do with joyriding and driving a car without the consent of the owner, which was an, an extension of some other difficulty I was in at the time too, but that's what I got charged with at the time. The judge asked me to get up and speak and when I got up to speak, my head went down right away and uh, I was shy, I was ashamed, I didn't want to be there, didn't want to be accountable uh, because I didn't want to be known as a bad person at that time either. And then the judge would look at me and he'd say, speak louder. And I'd try to speak louder and it was just got louder and less understood. Finally, the judge looked at my dad and he goes, what's wrong with your daughter? And then my dad got up and my dad says, uh, she can't speak, she can't uh, talk. The judge asked me to approach the bench. I approached the bench. He looked at me. He again tried to get me to talk and uh, I couldn't talk. I couldn't be understood. Then he told me to go back and stand next to my father. And he told me, my father said, uh, I can't get her to be still to go and see the plastic surgeons and get the surgeries that she needs done because I was going back and forth from Canada to the United States and a lot of other things. So the judge said, I had a boy coming up in front of me all the time. He was always in trouble over rinky-dink things. And he says, till I found out one day he couldn't hear. And he goes, under court order from ta uh, public expense, I had him taken out and set with um, earphones and he was able to hear and he goes, and to this day that boy has not come back in front of me in front of my court. And he says, uh, I'm going to court order you to be on probation for six months. In that six months you will be escorted by the probation officer to go and have plastic surgery and dental work done at the public's expense. So for the last six, seven months, a year after that, I went under heavy duty expenses, extensive dental work where I've sat in the dentist chair for 12 hours. And, but the work got done and after that too, I never did show up in front of his court again. Uh, I tried to uh, be on my best behavior, I guess. And then I came into Canada and I got into conflict with the law and a lot of things. And one of the things that I realized when I was going through trial in that in 1989 was uh, being misunderstood. And then years after of being ran through the system saying uh, it, it essentially failed. If I complied absolutely to uh, what was demanded of me and didn't challenge myself a lot why I was inside to uh, actually deal with my issues. But I went up in front of an elder and an elder told me a story one day. He says that um, it's the worst offense to lie. And it's from your community out in Ontario, the elder. He says, it's a bigger offense to go up in front of your people for something that you've done if you lie. Because if you lie, you can't get to the reality or the base problem of everything. But in a court of law, it's adversarial, it's a point of law. It's almost like they don't want to know the truth, it seems like. So you sit there under this mechanism that just goes on its own accord and that at the end you're sentenced, you go to prison, uh, you go through the process of going through the prison and then you get out. Well I thought 
wouldn't it be a lot more better for the victims, for everybody, to know my truth of my reality, of my involvement, of the way I've seen it, lived it, breathed it, and that it happened. Allow me to express the confusion and the chaos and the insanity that went into all that I was at the time that offense occurred. That doesn't happen in a court of law. Uh, my lawyer at the time goes, oh, don't expect to go into a court of law and have a Christian trial and have the outcome thereof, he says. They only deal on points of law. So in a way, when I wrote my book, like what was said, it's a glad you report magnified. If you were to go and read my book for the reality of it being my life sentence, and for me trying to figure out my life, myself, so that I will not be in the state of such confusion or whatever. I wanted to change my life that when I got out, that I can honestly look at my kids and try to give them another better lifestyle of life according to that. Uh, another story that was shared with me was there was a judge, but that judge being a judge was not allowed to contact me. But it came word through the grapevine that the judge read my book, and the judge in reading the book found out about the Gladue and the Gladue report. And this woman that went up in front of her went up as a... Uh, a woman who was doing drugs and drinking at the time that she was severely beat, assaulted, raped, and there was some form of uh, protection where she was protecting herself that she stabbed the aggressor against her. She went into the courtroom. She wouldn't talk. She wouldn't say anything. She just broke down. She, was cr she cried. The judge, under her own discretion, spoke to her, even when she was being attacked by the prosecution at the time in the court, and spoke to her and says, tell us what happened to you. We're not going to persecute you for what happened to you, but maybe as a consequence of you telling us what happened to you, that we can get a better insight into everything that went into why the offense occurred in the, the first place. And so that was another story that I could share. Another way in trying to get it across is everything in points of law is a choice. Everything is a referral. You'll go in front of the court and they'll say, well, so-and-so versus so-and-so, and this is the argument. What would be ideal would be for the Gladue report to actually be known that it's going to be submitted at the end of a trial. So why not try to implement the knowledge of the Gladue as maybe the trial itself is unfolding, if that's a possibility. That's where you as young minds, you can do anything that you choose to do. If you have the knowledge, the want, the belief, and the strive, you can do anything to implement it in a place that's almost got God complex in its complexities. Uh, so yeah, I believe in the Gladue report. I believe it's a long time coming. I believe that there's a lot of confusion around it. Uh, until last night, I had a different perception of things too, to where I felt ashamed and I thought, well, what good am I? What use am I? I'm too stone age, I'm in the pity pot sort of thing. That's what people perceive. But then I also know that this Gladue report can uh, be used to implement into changes of actually unifying what it was that I wanted way back in 89. I would have liked to get in front of the judge and say, let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you the reality of the feelings, of the processes, what this was hap when this was happening 
what I actually felt because I didn't know why I was feeling that. I didn't know why I went through what I was going through. You mentioned last night when you were speaking about the confusion of someone saying something about his wife and uh, his wife doesn't stop drinking, I'll kick her ass. You know, and that's a reality. That's a reality of what that person is. But then a lot of times even that person doesn't know that they need help because they've been raised into it. They've, they've lived through the racism. They lived on this side. They lived on this side. They lived in the imbalance of it all. Uh, they lived in hereditarily your tears, your thoughts, your feelings being passed down family through family through generation. In my book, I go back to Big Bear, which is four generations by, and what happened to him, and him being taken up on treaty when he was held accountable for offenses of people in his band that wasn't even a consequence of himself, and yet he got put into prison for treason. So if they did that to my great-grandfather, and it's been a complexity that hasn't been included into the justice system. It's not an idea of saying, submit this so they don't have to go to prison. No, I say submit it so that you can truly find out what this person's thinking, feeling, and then part of the punishment in, is having them to deal with themselves. Because one of the people that I see that are so ashamed are the Native people because the Native people know they are wrong, more so than anybody else. That's why if you put a Native person in front of an elder, the first thing they'll do is they'll back down and they'll be humble. You put somebody who has been toughened up, beaten up, and you put them in front of an authority figure like a police, they just say, well, I've been beat. I'm going to get beat again and they have a toughness towards that. They have a sternness towards that, and that was their way of surviving. So if you submit the Gladue report, and if it's understood in the court of law, then maybe the court of law can figure out as to why what went into the fence, and then the Gladue report can also be used as a suggestion as to implement for them what their needs are. Because I know that they, they got a parole thing now where uh, the Native community can come through and get the Native people to come back into their uh, community and work their way out of parole within their community and their services. Well, if you comply, combine that into the trial, into consideration, and then you can have the referrals afterwards, the, 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 the reports, the gladues. Because I've also known of some judges that need that base history to make a referral to as a point of law or a point of argument too. And the main thing is get educated. Don't give up. Go there. I'm too old to even contemplate going and getting the education but you've got your whole lifetime and your whole world ahead of you. Whatever you do for anything within the system feels over not only to Native people, because Native people have such a unique, different way of thinking in that, that if it actually got implemented in, eventually I think that the world would have a better society in the long run because they get away from the total absolute legalities and then get down to the human essence of why people are actually in conflict with the law. You get down to those human essence, es essence and like with me, I'm like, sure, I did this, I did this, I did this, but not the way that you understood. How therefore can I be accountable for what you assume that I did when I know better who I am, but I'm sitting here confused and you get lost in the middle. So yeah, uh, I don't know if I got all the topics across. Uh, you can truly learn to deal with the reality of self. You can help them help themselves deal with the reality of their offense 
implement it, maybe turn it over to the community of Nagod, uh, Native organizations or other people that have the ability to do that, to actually walk them through the healing process, because in the end, you have a far better community with healing somebody, having someone to know, under, understand themselves, being able to deal with their shame, understand their shame, and then come out of it a better human being, which is better for anybody and everybody else. In the end, it's always a balancing act in anything in life you do. So any strides that you strive ahead to achieve, know that there's going to be opposition to that. And so to create some form of balance, and it's always going to be imperfect. And that's what I got down here that I needed to say. Thank you. Thank you.